All right, so what we're calling this the enabling conditions hypothesis. I did send you an op-ed that was published, I think about two years ago in a newspaper in Bangladesh called neither necessary nor sufficient. So this is what the idea was, neither necessary nor sufficient, three enabling conditions for effective transboundary water management. So I started with this idea that does life cause death? Does oxygen cause fire? Does rain cause flood? What it means essentially then, if you look at these three questions going from very philosophical point of view that life caused death, of course you need life before you can die. Just because uh, if you are not alive, you cannot die. So basically, but does it cause it? The same thing with oxygen, really oxygen, does it cause fire? Why is this important? Because right now I'm sitting in my room, I have oxygen, but there's no fire. But think about a situation really about maybe 5,000 years ago when we did not know about all of this. And we had a lot of uh, fire in many different places. Then you are a scientific, scientifically minded individual. You went and measured everywhere and you find that in every place there is a fire, there is oxygen. So then you have a theory now. That theory tells you oxygen causes fire. It's a good theory because I don't think basically, think about it Little 5,000 years ago, I did not know any of this chemistry. I did not know oxygen, but I found out certain things are present in all situations when there is fire. So now I am basically very brilliant. I came up with a theory, oxygen cause fire. So this is the fundamental problem of cause and effect or observing certain things by observing certain other things and trying to link them. So what I argue that this is really fundamentally what scientific methods are all about. You take observations, then you formulate a hypothesis, and then you test it, and then you refine it. So now if you are 5,000 years ago, then how do you know that oxygen is not causing the fire? What do you have to do? This is where this idea of necessary sufficient conditions become extremely problematic. In this particular case, now you know that, like for example, in my room right now, I'm sitting here, there is oxygen, but there's no fire. So that means why is not there? So you may see oxygen is necessary, but not sufficient. What is sufficient then? You need to have some trigger. If you have a trigger, then it will start fire. See, if you now start basically put some fire here or with a, maybe with a candle or something, that means my house may get into fire. So that's the distinction we need to make, say, but this is right now it may seem very obvious. But when you get into the messiness of say transboundary water management or other complex problems, there are many, many causes can create an outcome. Many, many causes can create something that you see. So fire is what you see. Then you try to attribute some cause. And then you get into this idea of necessary and sufficient conditions. What we are arguing really in complexity that no, in complexity problems or the problems which are complex where many, many uh, variables and actors and institutions are interacting with each other you simply cannot isolate cause and effect very cleanly. There are causes, of course, but those are not easily identifiable. So as a result, you get into trouble. What happens really, you may identify something as cause, then very quickly you find out that is not the case. And you are seeing this with COVID-19 over the last 14 months. We have attributed to many, many things as a causal conditions. Then later on, we found out that may not be. And we even found out that all kinds of solutions starting from using bleach from our president. But these are all essentially just trying to relate some arbitrarily linked things. And in a simplest case, people would say that there are some correlation maybe. And you know it, the correlation is not causation, but that's, we said, this is a very cliche. We're not interested. We are fundamentally challenging this idea of cause and effect, that you simply cannot identify cause and effect very cleanly as you can in some other cases. Even in the simplest case, does rain cause flood? 
And one of you said, yes. Yes, it does. In some, in most cases it does, but in many cases it will not. So think of really in Boston, it was not raining for last several days. Now, if it rains one inch, there'll be no flood because most of the water will essentially infiltrate and go to the ground. Now, if it rains for three days in a row, yes, that basically soil will get saturated, you'll get flood. So that means you'll need some conditions. So here rain is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. The problem of this type of analysis really came, if you go back now, what is this idea of necessary and sufficient came? So I did dig basically deeper into this. It came from geometry. In geometry, it is very precise because I need to have four sides to have a rectangle and with 90 degree angle. I need to have three sides to have a triangle. There is no way around it. So I can explicitly say what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be considered a triangle. That is not the case for many physical systems, more importantly, many couple systems, like where you have natural systems and human systems, like our transboundary water problem. But you have natural systems, so water is getting coupled with the human systems of managing it and governing it. When they're coupled, the systems become complex this notion of necessary and sufficient conditions are not good enough. So I'll stop here just to give you a pause, see what you think about this distinction between necessary, sufficient conditions, then we'll go into enabling conditions. I presume we don't have to wait 5,000 years to make judgments about <laughs> such things. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in how you think we know enough to say that's only correlation, that's not causation. Yeah. Um, and, and is it really, could it be a function of time and perspective and experience and that there's not really a method to know that quickly? Yeah, so yeah, we'll get into something basically, Larry, I did not have a chance to discuss this with you. So we are basically making distinctions now to, between two types of facts, and this is part of the discussion that we'll have today. So one thing that over time that we have learned this idea of scientific method and scientific facts. Another thing that basically we are coining, and it has been used in social science for quite some time called social facts. And we are making a sharper distinction between these two right now. So what I argue really in this particular case that scientific facts are basically a particular type of facts. Those facts are verifiable, reproducible, replicable. Those will not depend on really perspective or notion. They may depend on methods over time, but there is a way to get around this. That's the whole idea of scientific methods. So we'll talk about that. Social fact, on the other hand, does not have to be true, does not even have to be verifiable. It just we believe. It's just that we accept it as reality. And that is fine too. And we have done many of this. For example, this whole idea of currency is a social fact. We give tremendous amount of value now to this something green called dollar. And whether I'm in Bangladesh or in Boston, doesn't matter, everybody accepts it. Whether they believe in me, whether I am a, a atheist or I'm agnostic or I am a Muslim, does not matter. You accept it that this is something that everybody thinks is good. And now think about what is happening with Iranian currency. It has been significantly devalued because of all this embargo that we have created. So that is really a paper. And that paper has certain value because everybody in the world thinks the dollar is very valuable. It's a social fact and there is no way to justify whether this is true or not. It is true right now. I can use it anywhere I want, but I do not know what will happen to this really 10 years from now. So those are the distinctions we need to make and we will make those distinctions when we're talking about scientific fact and social fact. In this particular case of your uh, fire can be, basically determined by scientific method. Because what can we do really, even 5,000 years, we didn't have to go that far. We can find out really that although oxygen is necessary, 
it does not create fire everywhere. So that means something else has to happen. So that is a systematic way of doing experiments and then to find that out. But I have seen few places that where there is fire, there is oxygen. So my immediate conclusion could be that oxygen causes fire. Then that has to be questioned and refined over time. So let's go with this enabling. So what we are saying here that we need three enabling conditions. And I was careful really not to use this idea of necessary and sufficient anymore. So three enabling conditions are needed for any boundary crossing complex water agreement to be initiated, implemented, and sustained. So this is a very big claim we're making here. So whether you are working with industry tea or you are working with Ganges, what we are saying there, Mashrof, if you want to be basically writing your Ganges treaty for 2026, yeah, we want to do it. We need to be very careful about these three conditions. You may say, no, no, I need something else. Then we'll talk about this. But what I am saying that at least these three are needed. So what are these three? The first one is this, there has to be an active recognition of interdependencies, meaning that if you need to sign a Ganges treaty between India and Bangladesh, they have to actively recognize interdependencies. India has to recognize that Bangladesh exists and they need them. Just saying that because India is upstream, Bangladesh is downstream, of course, there is already interdependency there, but that's not good enough. What is happening right now, if you think about it, like Onimesh and we worked on it a little bit uh, with Brahmaputra. Brahmaputra is creating serious problem between China and India. But there is no active recognition right now. China, India, although they're independently saying that yeah, you are using our water and we are in a serious trouble, but they have never so far actively recognized this. As a result, really, what we argued that no, I don't think they're going to go to any treaty and they're not right now. Although there is a lot of noise, a lot of discussion, a lot of international forum, international funding agency trying to find out what is going on in Brahmaputra. What I am arguing that I am yet to see anything that is tangible happening in the Brahmaputra. So if you have to ask me, although these are dangerous game to play, in terms of prediction, there would not be a Brahmaputra treaty signed unless this recognition is active between China and India. And that is exactly what happened really. if you look at Indus Water Treaty. Indus Water Treaty was signed in 1960 between Pakistan and India because they actively recognized that this is important. About the same time, President Johnson from the US sent another envoy to Israel and Palestine to have Jordan Treaty. Jordan Treaty was not signed until 1994. So why that one was signed in 1960, another was in 1994. In both cases, U.S. was a basically a significant player. So you need to think about those really. Then I say, yeah, look, at that time they did not recognize. Jordan did not recognize that Israel is important or vice versa. So as a result, it took a long time. In 1994, they came and basically they signed a peace treaty. Part of that was a water treaty too. So you just think about those two cases between Indus and Jordan, then you'd get some to really what this enabling condition one means. Second one is that I'm sure you have talked about this mutual value creation. So just because you have recognized a problem and you have a conflict is not good enough. Now, now you have to see really, can you create some mutual value through negotiation that both party will benefit? Because otherwise you, you, you have limited amount of water and you have no way to divide this and your actual need is much more than what is actually available, then how do you get around this? So only way then you can get around this if you can create some mutual value and then you can do it many different ways. I'm sure Lady and Animesh has given you ideas of really how to create mutual values, how do you connect different type of sectors and different resources and so on. It doesn't, you don't have to talk about water only. You can bring in food, you can bring in energy, you can bring in security, you can bring in military, military power, all kinds of things can be done. Yeah. Uh, so uh, to discuss these things, um, if we consider this uh, Ganges example, uh, we already had the Ganges Treaty, but in my view, this mutual value creation didn't uh, happen until now. So uh, 
but already the treaty has been signed. So what do you say about that? This, Although this enabling condition uh, didn't uh, meet, but there is a treaty or a ne negotiation. No, no, so you see here we say the initially implemented and sustained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can have it because you have it for a, there were some basically all the mutual value put, fully was not done but it was done partly there were certain things done for example bangladesh could have told india that look if we want to have this treaty now we want you want transit we'll give you transit see india wanted transit really from basically to go through bangladesh to tripura see they want to do this then let's do this the bangladesh is trying to do this ganges barrage now so for Ganges Baraj, India may get flooded a little bit. Can that be brought into the picture? So the issue is that basically you have to bring in other issues. Those are now basically being discussed in Bangladesh right now. If you think about like, what is the particular problem with the Ganges? Ganges is not a problem for the flood season. The problem is really the dry season. So in the dry season, the flow goes down so low that we have a serious basically issues of water shortage so take a hypothetical example if you take the entire water basically during the dry season it's about 4000 cubic still it will not be good enough to keep the calcutta port navigable one of the primary reason that india wanted to build the faraka barrage was to keep calcutta port navigable but in the dry season the flow goes so low it still cannot even they have taken the, all the water so that means they have to come up with alternative sources. Can they use groundwater? Can this basically store water during the flood season over extended period of the river? That is what Bangladesh proposed in the Ganges barrage. So this is like a over 50 mile river that will be using as a storage device because Bangladesh is a very flat country. We cannot create another dam. So that's another mutual mutual value creation option can be explored. Can I ask a question, Professor? Please. So you said something very interesting that um, creating mutual values and from from where I understood, I might be wrong, that anything goes. So one of the uh, one of the tension between Bangladesh and India is Bangladesh being used uh, as a as a vessel to create trouble in, in its uh, seven sisters. So, which is why, like, it is of India's interest to maintain the security in Bangladesh. So, I'm wondering, like, if if there, that sort of uh, value can be created, even I mean, can this be used as a bar bargaining chip? So, that is what I want to understand. No, definitely yes. I'll tell you something that is, I think, you hit it exactly right. So, about three years ago, when we have our water diplomacy workshop, and Larry may remember, we have four individuals from Bangladesh Foreign Ministry came from foreign ministry to really to learn about water diplomacy in our workshop and their primary concern was that they want to work on the water treaty what would they do so we discussed this seven sisters issue and we discussed that this is an issue that yeah this is a security problem for india can that be used that bangladesh will create opportunity for that so that these insurgencies cannot go cannot create problem for india yes this is open for discussion Wow. No you can link that with basically water. No, in that case, so I can actually bring security where I work actually. Yes, you can. You can and, and definitely, and this is a relevant problem for, for India to basically keep taking care of those seven sisters and this insurgency is a serious security problem. And Bangladesh can help. And also Bangladesh can be used as a transit. But then Bangladesh has to find us something else in return. That is where the discussion must go on. This is the discussion I had with the foreign minister. And even after that, so I went to Bangladesh and we did have a workshop on water diplomacy within the foreign, basically, ministry. And then pandemic started, of course, then we got stuck. The difficulty, I'll tell you, this is just not to be shared with Bangladesh government. So I think the difficulty that we have in Bangladesh, in many of these ministries are extremely, I think I would say, progressive. but there is no system memory meaning that water secretary is water secretary right now uh, suddenly he gets transferred to transportation that memory doesn't exist that basically he initiated certain things and that does not continue to the next secretary 
So as a result, really, you reinvent everything every time. And that's a problem. I mean, lack that's of institutional memory is like, it's, it's a serious issue in developing countries like Bangladesh. Uh, I, I completely agree. I work for the government, so I understand. So that's a different problem. So that's where we'll go later, maybe. So the third one that we are saying, this adaptive regime of governance. And that is also very important because you need to anticipate. I think, Hosnan, you were saying that, yes, in industry, there is no climate change mentioned. Because in 1960, we did not know even climate existed, that around climate change. So we have no idea about this. So, but they did not put any provision, but they did put some other provision though. If you look at the industry, they had a technical provision that they said that if there is a technical problem that Pakistan and India cannot resolve, somebody else should come into the picture. You know what that somebody else was? I have mentioned it already. Oh, you yeah. did? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So, so that was brilliant. That was brilliant. The question is basically why the MIT president has to be basically somebody has to come in and then appoint a body because they thought MIT is a good technical institution. They may still exist for 50, 60 years from now, and they will have no interest in India and Pakistan. So this was brilliant. So when you are trying to design this treaty for Indus or for the Ganges, you need to be also thinking forward. Basically, you don't know what will happen, whether climate change will come, what will happen is another COVID-22 comes in, who knows? But there has to be some provisions so that this can be used. What we are arguing in this enabling condition hypothesis is this, that these three, if they are not in place, your treaty is not going to be basically implemented well, it cannot be sustained very well. That's a big claim. So I want to hear, or maybe you can do it later as well, that find out a treaty that was initiated, implemented, and sustained for a long period of time, but one of these conditions were missing. That would be good exercise. I could not find one yet. But are these going to guarantee success? No. They're not going to guarantee success, but they will be, you can see it, these are minimum subset. So one example I usually give to make it simpler is that if you want to get a PhD, what are the enabling conditions? Number one is obvious, I think, is that you have to be alive, otherwise you cannot do it, so fine. Number two is that you need to have a bachelor's, unless you're getting an honorary degree. We're not talking about honorary degree. If it's an earned PhD, you need to have a bachelor's. So which bachelor's? I do not know. It could be in political science. It could be in hydrology. It could be in computer science. It does not matter. But you need to have a bachelor's at least. Everything else are situational. You need to have an advisor. You need to have funding. You need to have a topic. All kinds of things will be needed. And then, of course, you have to pass the qualifying exam. A department has different requirements. You have to take this course, that course. Those I'll call those situational conditions. If first two enabling conditions are not there, you'll not get it. But just because you have those first two, doesn't will that mean that you'll get PhD? No. So that's what that difference is. So when you're thinking about this, really think on along those lines. So these are not necessary and sufficient conditions. I'm not telling you what will be necessary to get a PhD, what will be sufficient to get a PhD. But I'm just telling you that you need these two enabling conditions, then you need many, many situational conditions. And those situational conditions are context dependent. It will depend whether it's at MIT or Tufts or somewhere else, or you, whether you're in engineering versus in urban planning, they have different requirements. But, but then uh, what is the difference between a necessary condition and enabling condition? Oh, no, necessary conditions does necessary conditions could be many. I am telling you that you don't need more than these three. I can come up with many necessary conditions that may not still satisfy all. And see, that's the reason I think. See, which one is the reason I think I want to get away from this necessary and sufficient? As we mentioned, this really came from a very structured discipline called geometry. Mm -hmm. So. I am trying to find solve a geometric problem. Now I want to apply it to my messy transboundary water management problem. That's the reason I want to make the distinction. Because here, if you look at the news and look at writings, you'll see that yeah, this was not a necessary condition. 
uh, we did not satisfy necessary condition. Then you ask them, okay, so what are the necessary conditions? So to give you a simple example, I tell you that I want to go from here to New York. So what are the necessary and sufficient conditions? Can you exhaustively write this? No, okay. there would be thousands. So it is not possible to cover them all. You got it. So this is basically a very large space. I may decide to walk. I may decide to take a plane. I'll take a bike. I'll take a bike and then I will take a boat. Or I have a donkey. So I essentially cannot exhaustively write down all the conditions. That's what the difficulty is. So that brings us to something else really that I want to start maybe our talk. That So let's start but there. Legal language sometimes, uh, sometimes like try to, I mean, make conditions that are exhaustive. For example, if the copyright of a chocolate is asked by a lawyer, then he would write that, this chocolates this chocolate has to be from this particular uh, this particular tree and it cannot be uh, consumed by any other party uh, uh, without paying the money to the original company in any form so in this way they can probably i mean minimize i don't know whether i could uh, make sense or not but the legal language sometimes tries to i mean cover all those all those conditions that you say but like there are so many conditions sure so this is where essentially now I think you got it exactly right. So this is where basically, although we don't want to talk about our previous precedent. So now if you come into the problem, really, if you want to define really what the presidency should entail, does president have to really file taxes and make it clear? This was not explicit. It was not explicitly he has to file taxes and make it public. So he decided not to do it. Now, the question is, how many things can you write down explicitly the president has to do? Then I have to even tell you that when he goes to the bathroom, this is what he has to use. Just to make oh, it. So I, I got that. I got that. the problem is, so this is exactly the point. So for, for the presidency of the United States, how many things you can explicitly write what he or she do or does really as a president? We cannot do this. So we are assuming that certain things they will do because they are morally responsible individuals. I cannot be explicit about them. Because if I make it explicit, then it becomes essentially routine, as you said, that yeah, you can write it down. This particular chocolate came from this particular tree, and this can be eaten by only this particular individual. Uh, fine. But then how many of them you'll write? That is okay. where essentially necessary and sufficient conditions miserably fail, particularly in the system when those are coupled. It can be fine. Right now, we say, like, if you have asked me, the best law that we have is Newton's laws of gravity. What is it that basically Apple fall? An Apple was falling before Newton. We just did not understand this. He was brilliant to find out a particular law that applies everywhere right now. Whether I'm in Bangladesh or in Boston, Apple Falls, and I know that I can explain it by gravity. So that's a law which is, I would say, the physical law that is replicable, verifiable everywhere you go. Now, to take an example for water that I use is that water flows usually downhill because of the energy gradient. That's the physical law. But water also flows uphill. For example, water flows uphill in the American West to money in my home on the second floor because I put a pump. Otherwise, water cannot go to my second floor. By gravity, it should go down. How come? How, how could I get water in my second floor bathroom? I get it because the water is pressurized. So I can create conditions that really the things can also violate the physical laws. Now, when those physical laws are violated by human intentions, then you have a problem. Like, for example, Ganges was flowing fine. India decided to build a barrage. Barrage was not there. Now they can control it. So that's a physical control of water, really, which is violating the physical principles. And that's when now your natural systems and human systems are coupled, and then it becomes a complex problem. Is it making sense? Yes, 
All right. So here I think I'll give you a quiz and then we'll continue. So how many colors do you see here? What are diplomacy, a principal pragmatic approach to govern, manage complex societal problems? How many three. colors? Three. Three. Good. So remember three. Three is important here. Then I'll tell you something else. So, so what are a diplomacy, a principal, pragmatic, govern, complex problems? So put all kinds of words. And I'm sure you, you have heard many of these words many, many times in this class. So how many colors are here? Seven. 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 Good. Seven. So you have three and then you have seven. So I'll just give you one basically clue and then we'll discuss this at the end of the class. So if you really want to be very scientific about this, there are only three colors. R, B, G. Red, blue and green. Then everywhere you go really this seven color comes in. There are seven colors of rainbow. There are seven heavens. There are all kinds of seven came into the picture. What is this three and seven then came from? I have only three color. Why do I have seven? Why do people say that there are seven colors in rainbow? In reality, if you go to the fundamental color, there are only three. Now, if you go to your computer, really, and if you have a basic, uh, 24-bit machine, you probably have about on the order of 8 million colors based on these three combination of RBG. So I can go from 3 to 8 million. And now if you just give you a color palette and I tell you that find it out what color is this, there is simply no you can find it out unless I tell you what those are. So the, what is my point here? The point is that you can take three things and put it in different ways and you can get millions of millions of combinations. Same thing is true for these necessary and sufficient conditions. I can take three variables or three situations in a particular water conflict and arrange it in different ways. I can get many, many combinations. So in this particular from three to seven to millions, <coughs> that is the case that means my necessary and sufficient conditions will never be able to ex be exhaustive i cannot do it although fundamentally they are related maybe to only three but i cannot come to that three level at the, if i come to that three level is too abstract so that's why they put this basically mumbo jumbo stuff here they basically you have only 26 letters but you can create a Shakespeare to water diplomacy book and everything else in between by different combinations of letters. That is exactly the point really with these interconnected systems. Your building blocks may be very few, but the way those building blocks are interconnected and interdependent may create a different situations. And that has serious implications really in what the way we will think about water. So let's go there here. So I'll start with this many phases of water crisis. If you think about it really, what is water crisis? What is crisis really, if you think about UN, they will tell you that if you have 20 liters of water per person per day from an improved source, you have access to water. That's the standard definition and that definition is used globally. Based on that definition, there are about 760 million people who does not have access to water. So this is what we're trying to do with these our SDG. Now, if you think about this, this is really not true. The 760 million is not true. Why is not true? There are about 2 billion people lives in slums across the globe, from Dhaka slum to Bombay slum to Nairobi slums and everywhere and from Brazil. And these people are not even counted. Why are not they counted? Because most of them are in illegal government land. So government does not provide them water, so they are not even counted. They don't have access to water or access to doesn't matter. So who are these 760 million people? These people are essentially people in rural villages in Africa and Asia. So this is one problem with water, access to water, definition of water crisis. On the other hand, really, when they talk about water scarcity, 
they have a different definition. What is this? This is fewer than 1000 cubic meter of water per person per year. So if you're in the US, if you have 1000 cubic meter of water per person per year, you are not water scarce. So Boston, for example, is not water scarce. But Nevada is. But as a whole, US is not. That translates to 2740 liter per person per day. Look at the difference between 20 and 2740. Huge difference. Do you have access to water versus are you water scarce? These are two different things. And we often then get confused really what, which one are you trying to address? If you go to SDG, it's not clear what they want to do. They have their thing is goal seven, I think is related to water and they have all kinds of things there. But it's so, I would say nebulous that it's not clear exactly how they're going to measure this and how they're going to implement this. So, so Access to water is not necessarily constant by availability to water, really. It is something else. So when you want to talk about water crisis and your objective is to provide water to a slum in Bangladesh, it's a very different problem than saying that I want to have water for agriculture production in Bangladesh. These are two different problems. And oftentimes we confuse them. And let's go to the next one. So what are the scientific facts versus a societal problem here? Many more people die from unsafe water than from all forms of violence, including war. So these are statistical facts. There are also economic analysis. Every dollar invested in safe water and sanitation yields anywhere between five to twenty-seven dollars in economic benefits. You don't have to agree whether five or twenty-seven, it's more than one dollar. We'll not go into the economic argument here for now. But at least there are many, many studies that has done this that if I invest $1 right now, I can get five to $27. So that means I can make more money, still I'm not doing it. So what is the problem? And then I say, okay, 768 million people lack access to water, 2 billion people are living in high water scarcity region. So how come we're not doing anything about this? And this is the statistics I had when I was a graduate student many, many years ago. How could you have a crisis then you're not resolving this crisis? So that means it's not a crisis. So why is not? Let's say that I am generous. I want to make 50 liters, not 20. 50 per person per day. Give me $120 billion. I can do it for everyone in the globe. Look at the global GDP, $85 trillion. Only 0.14% of global GDP. So how come this is a global community where so much basically benevolent, so much generous, you cannot spend even 0.14% of our GDP to give water to everyone. So the problem is not economic. Then. Problem is not that we don't have the technology. So how do I go then? So this is where I think maybe we can be a little bit more creative as water diplomats that these are not really the argument that people are making. We need to make a different types of arguments. So then it comes really basically, this is the cover page of our book. So we're saying that, look, I think when you have to look at this problem, really, you need to look at this. There are natural domain problem. There are societal domain problem. These have been studied forever, but they also happen in a politically real world. So one in water diplomacy, what we are arguing for last several years that look, you need to understand the natural problem, you need to understand the societal problem. You need to also understand that this is happening in a politically real world. So how do I combine this scientific knowledge and social knowledge in a politically real world where things will have some way to at least have some traction? I don't have to discuss this idea of really, look, I only need 0.14% Four percent of GDP still people do not have access to water, 768 million people do not have access to water. These are all known problems. Go to any water literature right now, any water crisis, you'll see these statistics given everywhere. So how come nothing is being done then? Those are the type of questions we want to raise and hopefully you guys will have some clue really when you are in your organization to have some impact. So the reason I think what we argue that is happening, that there are di differences in political boundaries, knowledge, know-how, management, these are all 
basically happening at multiple scales. And these choices are particularly problematic because they cross boundaries, they have uncertainty, they have multiplicity of values. So these are not basically unknown. What we are basically hoping to do with our water diplomacy framework is that we want to explicitly recognize this and see really how to at least address some of it so that we can go or we can be a little bit better than what we were yesterday. See, I may not be here for another 30 years, so I could not see this changing very much in 30 years. In 30 years, really, we still had the same number of people dying out of this lack of sanitation and water across the globe. So are we basically dumb or we are just too insensitive? So this is what essentially is we are standing here. And we in a present year, where we came from past, but we don't know exactly where we came because past is, although came happened once, the interpretation of past could be quite different really because for example if you think about really how i came where i am right now if you ask my your my mother or my wife or my daughter they will have different stories and some of these stories will be probably similar but it will not be exactly the same so that means our understanding of the past is also really colored by our own experience our own perspectives and the way we have seen it the problem even is that future could be even more unknown because we have no clue how it will happen. But only thing we have is past. So how do I create water management situations really by looking at the past, knowing that future is unknown? So this is the fundamental puzzle. It's a scientific puzzle as well as social puzzle. This is where you need to basically, the question you were raising, okay, in 1960, they didn't know about climate change. I don't know what will happen in the next 50 years. We did not know that COVID-19 will come really in 2020. It did, and it changed the life significantly. So those are unknown. And then we need to have some way to essentially deal with it. What is the next COVID going to come? We don't know. So what does that tell you? What tells you really that most of our understanding really from science is from physics. So what physics tells us really that with classical physics, I can essentially describe the world in a very interesting and very predictable way. But the problem with complex system is that they are not easily describable by classical physics or quantum mechanics. Say, so, world is not deterministic, world is also not random. It is somewhere in between. That's where the complex system is. Complex systems argues that this is not a purely predictable system. At the same time, it is not a random system either. So everything that you've learned in school now is really not becoming very useful. Because everything you learned is essentially either based on some classical physics, which is deterministic equations, or statistics. But we are arguing that for complex system, neither will work. You need a combination of these two. Then you come with this. This basically two scientists in 1973, they were telling you the search for scientific basis for confronting problems of social policy is bound to fail. And this is a very classical paper really written in 1973, cited over 10,000 times now. So is this a wicked problem? Yeah, it is okay. the same, same group. So they were very brilliant, two young assistant professor from Berkeley in 1973. So what they were telling me that when you are confronted with complex problems, we, are, we don't talk wicked because wicked, I don't like this word, but they use wicked. But wicked essentially in their term is very similar to what we call complex. And these are interconnected problems. These are interdependent problems. There is simply no way to do cause and effect, and particularly when there are a social policy involved. Then came this lady really from here, Wellesley. She was an economics professor and a chair. She said, you can't take politics out of this analysis. Now you have three things. You have physical systems, you have social system, you have political systems. And what we argue that in water diplomacy, we try to mix them up. And we say that all three are important and you need to be careful about all three. You just cannot take one or the other. And then your solution is not going to be very sustainable. So uh, here, how is the difference between the social system and the political system? Sometimes. Yeah, so, okay. Is, so, is... yeah, so then you have to go, yeah, you know, that, that is a good point. You have to go then to our diagram here. Let me see if I can go back. So, so, 
I did not use society. I said societal. So societal, we are saying that there are only three things because we want to make life simpler. We said we put governance, assets, and norms and values as societal. We are keeping political as a different entity. So this separation in many places you may find to, to be not really that clear. You can put politics also in societal domain. That would be fine. But then you need to be explicit. But here we are explicit. We are saying that for us, when we talk about natural systems, we are talking about quality, quantity, and ecosystems. Measurable, quantifiable, more or less. When we talk about societal systems, we talk about governance, and we are keeping it broad. Governance could be your NGO to your government to basically your uh, water board in Pakistan or Bangladesh. Norms and values could be also quite broad. It could be your cultural values. It could be your religious values of water. So we are keeping them broad. Assets is not only money. It could be human assets too. So we are being very careful. When we coin these terms, we spend a lot of time thinking about those. So we kept them in a way that we don't need any more than these six. And we have asked this question to many of, my, of these water, uh, water diplomacy workshop attendees that look, do I need anything else? Have we missed anything? Uh, tell us something that we missed. So maybe I will ask you the same question. Have we missed any variables that you need to include to talk about water conflicts? Those are not there in this particular figure. Think of a variable or an actor or an institution. We are saying that everything is included here. Maybe think about it. And maybe before the end of the semester, you can let Onimesh know. Because we, we, these are big claims we're making. They look, I think you don't need anything else. These six are good enough. Because we have defined this sufficiently broad so that you can go and dig deeper into this. All right. So there, those essentially six now we are saying that we can basically even write it down in a little bit more systematic way. We're talking about variables and processes that will come from the natural domain. Actors and institutions will come from societal domain. Okay. And then you have values, interests, and tools. And we go in that particular order. So values really, so these you need to be very, very careful because what ends up happening in most cases, since I came from a totally different domain, when I was doing my engineering stuff, we were particularly interested in tools. And then we basically started working with Larry and we found out that there is something called interests and positions. And then we need to talk about values. So now we get into really entangled mass. Then you have problems, policies, and politics. But we argue that these things have to come into place. You have a problem, you have a politics, you have a politics. Unless these three are aligned properly, you're not going to get a solution that will be basically resilient and sustainable. Just think about what happened really between January 20 and then today's April 27, just three months. In three months, we have already vaccinated about 200 million people. That was not the case in December, January. What happened? Not, not Nothing much changed really in the US. Few people changed in White House. Other than that, most of the actors and institutions are the same. So some of the problems, politics and politics has to align properly. If it does, things can explode or things can get totally basically out of control. So that's what the basically big time thinking about is basically just the difference between January 20th and say April 27th. So this multiplicity of choices, then what it does really, this essentially fundamentally challenge this idea of finding optimal solutions. This is where basically Ritter and Weber found in 1973. They were talking about that when you have a social problem, when this is coupled, we are calling them now coupled natural human system problem, to look for optimal solution is impossible. So that's a recognition we must have because this is a recognition at least oftentimes we do not have when we are coming from a technical domain. From a technical domain, we want to find an optimal solution very quickly. And optimal solutions are possible for a well-structured systems. I can find out the optimal temperature for my room. There is no problem because I can put enough basically heating and air conditioning and thermometer to get it done. But if I want to do optimal temperature for 
city of Boston, it cannot be done because city of Boston is open. Now things are coming back and forth from all kinds of, from maybe from Connecticut or from Maine or from Canada, where the cold air is coming in. So I cannot make this. But on the other end, my room, I can do it because room is bounded. So room is basically, it has boundaries. It can be insulated. It can be done. So if the system is bounded, system is well-structured, system is well-defined, optimal solutions are okay. But in most natural systems, they are not. In almost all coupled systems, is impossible. When the natural systems and human systems are coupled, then you cannot find it. Then you need to be contingent and context. Then you say, fine, then what did I learn? If everything depends on the context and everything is contingent, why come to school? Just go and do it. That's what I think will give you some clue really with maybe with what are diplomacy and principle pragmatism, how that can be done, although they're contingent, although they're contextual. So what are diplomacy then what is this? So scientific method, I'll say then in general is objective. So we'll talk about a little bit more closely. So policy and decision-making is subjective. Whether you like it or not, that's what it is. So whether your political bias is Biden versus Trump administration, you're seeing that policy making and decision making. So this is going to be subjective whether we like it or not. Then we're saying the scientific facts are objective. And this will be maybe I think there are nuances that we don't want to get into right now. Social facts are subjective. So I'm making a sharp distinction between these two things. So there is a scientific fact and there is a social fact. When we talked about this idea of alternative fact, what people got confused is that they were mixing it up. Social facts are basically, there are alternative facts. Scientific fact, there is no alternative facts. If I take my temperature, if you can find it to be 98.4, it is 98.4. Maybe with another thermometer, you can get 98.5. It cannot be 200 degrees. So that's a scientific fact. I said this is objective, replicable, reproducible. Social fact would be how I feel about the temperature. I may feel perfectly fine and Larry may feel perfectly hot with the same temperature. Although the thermometer is measuring same temperature, how both of us feel is quite different. That's a social fact that simply cannot be objectively defined and you don't have to. But in decision making, both are important really. I just cannot use scientific fact to make decisions which will affect human beings. I can do this daily for machines, but when I bring in human beings, when they have emotion, they have a agencies, they have temptations, I cannot use just scientific facts and assume that it will work. So as a result, now water diplomacy is both subjective and objective. So that is essentially very problematic in terms of implementation, but this is also very good because this is the way you'll keep your job for the next 50 years, because not anybody can do it that well. So that's the reason I think the so lady is doing for 50 years. I hope I can do it too. For another 20 years, I'll tell you really what to do. And that is exactly where I think the brilliance and the ingenuity will come in, that this is not easily separable. I cannot just take objective facts and claim that I will be able to do water management very well. Neither can I do it subjectively either. So if I can combine these two in some creative ways, you'll have credibility and you'll be able to do it. Professor Shafiq. Yep, please. Can, can you repeat again the example of the temperature with this to, to illustrate the, uh, the difference between the subjective and objective? Okay, so just one second here. Let me see here. So, Objective facts would be, I would say, we, we'll go this into a little bit more detail also. So objective fact, I am defining it very sharply. So in my definition, objective fact is based on scientific methods which are observable. It has to be observable. If it is not observable, so observable by how? So then basically, if you really want to be very sharp, you say that we have five senses. If these are not sensed by your five senses, it doesn't exist. So I'll tell you, although I don't want to basically make our friend Pinker in other school on the red line, he's a cognitive psychologist in at Harvard, really. So he would tell you really everything else that you cannot sense or can observe doesn't exist. 
So trust is not, it doesn't exist. A trust is simply, can, it's not measurable. He has a whole book called Enlightenment, 700 pages with hundreds of thousands of graphs. And he's showing that with Enlightenment, we have basically done remarkably well because in all measures that he shows, of course, he's very selective. in he, showing that everything has improved. Like our infant mortality has improved, our war has gone down, people dying from war has gone down, people dying out of hunger has gone down. So we are doing well. But in that book, trust was not even mentioned once. Because he doesn't care really about trust. So for him, it's a scientific fact. Unless it is observable, it's not scientific. Social fact is now, I feel bad. And we have too many people suffering from mental disease right now. Mental disease will become the most pandemic really in next 20 years. He doesn't want to, he doesn't talk, want to talk about this. So for him, those are subjective judgment, you figure it out. So that's the difference really. Things, those are not observable, doesn't exist. So that's a very sharp, I would say very crude definition, but that's the way I try to do this also. So I'll say the something subjective is meaning that these are not easily verifiable. But I do disagree with him that no, they exist. I may not be able to measure them, but they are real. And you may not be, you may, he will say that they are not even real. They're just a fiction of your imagination. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that brings us to the, this, I think this you like now. So here, I want you to look at these two pictures and I thought it was very nice. So there is a difference between myth and fact. Look at this first figure and then Remember what this individual is doing. This individual now remembers myth. Although you have given him 12 facts. So what is the problem? The problem is that our cognitive ability to process information is not really very good. So if you give me a lot of information, it's happening with COVID. If you think about COVID, really, people are so confused. It's not that people are confused. People just simply cannot separate it out. Because you are giving so many facts and so many conflicting facts. So ultimately you remember the myth that most likely I will die. Although the probability of you dying is extremely low, even if you get it. On the other hand, if you can give myth with some carefully constructed facts, you do remember the fact. So the argument that I will make here is that our challenge is to essentially, when I'm trying to debunk some of this myth or some of the social facts, to create scientific facts, those are easily digestible to the audience that I'm giving it to. But that's very, very powerful because otherwise I can keep talking about this climate change. A general public does not understand what I'm talking about. As a result, they think it's a hoax. So what does that mean really is this. When you're trying to replace a myth from somebody's mind, you need to replace it by some facts. Otherwise, it will get replaced by another myth. So the question is basically, and the, the politicians are extremely powerful really in basically replacing myths. And myths are not, not really easily discounted. I don't believe that myth can be easily taken out. They will be there. The challenge is to create meet those are a little bit more scientifically valid. If you can do this, then I think you have an alternative narrative. Otherwise, you don't have an alternative narrative. You have no way to make any influence in the policy making and the decision making. So that brings us to something that I like is that you remember really you talk about what a diplomacy framework. We did not say that it's a model. It is not even a theory right now. So what is a framework? Framework is something that is it's some general ideas and general relationships that gives you to address a particular problem in a particular way. So that is the framework. When the framework get tested over time, so we are doing it for many, many years right now, the gradually it will become a theory. Eventually it will become a model and predictable. So right now we will put our water diplomacy principle pragmatism as framework. This framework allows us to explain those things in certain ways. It allows us to intervene in certain ways. 
when it becomes really a theory, then you get basically like evolution. Evolution is a theory. Newton's law is a law. Newton's law is not a theory. It's not a framework. So there is a distinction between framework theory and model. So model is at the level that you are at the Newton's law. So things are doesn't matter really whether I'm in Boston or I'm in Brazil. Newton's law applies. So that is where the difference is. So if you can develop certain law, those are context independent, then you have a law. So do I have a law for water? No, I don't. I don't have a water diplomacy law. We have a water diplomacy framework. And that framework with time will probably get tested, refined, and get into theory and hopefully into model someday. So what are the principles then? The principle that we are trying to use here in principle pragmatic framework is this objective scientific method. So we'll say that there is an objective scientific method, these five senses, it allows me to do certain things in certain ways. Those will be independent of context. We giving our example of taking temperature. So temperature with a the thermometer is a measurable thing. I can easily validate this. There is no ambiguity there. A pragmatism comes in this sub subjective interpretation now because the example that I was giving that how I feel about temperature is a subjective interpretation. That interpretation should not be confused with scientific methods, but I need both. I need scientific method. I need also subjective interpretation. This is exactly where water diplomacy comes in that we just not need scientific methods. We also need subjective interpretation of the local values, local context. Then if I can combine these two, we get principle pragmatism, that it is subjective and objective. The same thing that we talked about our water diplomacy. Then we said that, okay, like I think, I don't know, you have talked about this. We look at world in very, I would say the simple ways. We said that there are only three types of systems. And our first job is to identify that problem. And that's the diagnosis and characterization. So it's simple problems. But these causal relationships are well understood. Complicated is often ambiguous, but not easily identified, but you can still identify this. Then you have complex problems, not easily identifiable, only perceivable in retrospect. So a good example of this would be like flushing your toilet. You can go and buy a basically a toilet system from Home Depot for $100. It will work out very nicely, no problem. Bringing water to your home from Kwaban, like about 50 miles away, and taking the water on the 16th floor of your room and you get out, you get warm water, that's a complicated system. I need lots of pumps and pipes and then chlorination and heating and so on. Complex problem is the one that when we created this Kwaban reservoir, we have also eliminated four villages from Kwaban because we wanted to create a large reservoir. A lot of people has lost their homes and they had to be bought out. So was this the right thing to do? Because you are basically removing human beings from four towns for 200 years because Boston has to grow. Boston needed more water. They needed to create a Kwaban Reserve in 1920s. So they created this by eliminating four villages. And there are still people complaining that that was not the right thing to do. So that's a complex problem where you have basically coupled a natural system with human systems. Now the system is, in this case, is knowable and predictable. The flushing a toilet is more or less predictable. This is complicated, but it's still more or less predictable. Not always, but this one is most of the time unpredictable and emergent, meaning that things will just emerge that you had no idea really it was going to come. And from your arsenic problem, you have seen some of this emergence, we'll talk about a little bit more. If you are to intervene in these systems, this will work with best practices. And this is where I think most of the people got it wrong. And I think we want to, you to be very careful. What we are saying here is that your best practices will apply very well for simple systems. If you go into complicated system, you need some expert knowledge now and some contextual knowledge. If you go into complex system, now you need 
something totally different. You need a synthesis of scientific facts and social facts. You simply cannot use best practices because there is no best practices for complex systems. And although you will hear this time often that give me a roadmap. No, I cannot give you a roadmap. Roadmap assumes that I know the road. So how do I know the road? I know the road because I've seen it in the past. So that means I'm assuming the past will essentially be similar in the future as well. If the future is a little bit different than the past, my past knowledge is not going to be very useful. So I cannot have a roadmap. So to hope for a roadmap, to hope for a best practices is an illusion we must abandon to deal with complex problems. Is that making sense? So this is very important because we need to make a distinction between these three class of problems. Your first job would be to essentially decide which one is simple, which one is complicated, and which one is complex. And then you cannot use the tool those will be applicable for simple system when the problem is actually complex or vice versa. So if you okay. assume that everybody is working on um, very complex problems, each of the cases you heard about at the beginning that people described, they're, they're all complex. They may have simple components within them, but basically the conflicts and what's at the heart of the conflicts are complex. It sounds from your description like it's not really possible to be usefully prescriptive in a situation in which the problems you're dealing with are highly complex. Do you think that's right or do we- No, I think, no, <laughs> that we're in trouble. At some level it is, but at some level it is not. So let me see what I can explain. So the story that what has to happen then is when you are confronted with a problem like, so let's say that we are confronted with the problem of a Ganges water treaty. So let's take this as an example. Then we have to decide really when we talk about Ganges water treaty, what are we talking about? So if you ask me right now, so I will say Ganges water treaty should primarily focus on the dry season flow. So now I'm trying to make the problem a little bit sharper. Why dry season flow? In the wet season, I have about 70 to 80,000 cubic meter per second of water flow. That is a flood season. Flood season lasts for a few weeks, but it creates a problem, but that is a recurring phenomenon. Then in the dry season, it's almost about eight to nine months. That creates significant problem, both from water availability for ecosystems to irrigation to navigability, so many, many things. So I will focus on that part. Then my question would be, the, okay, so given that dry season flow is only 4,000 as opposed to 80,000, now what can I do? How do I basically resolve this complexity of the problem? Now we have to come up with really with India and sit down and see really what are the options can I have? What are the options those are possible so that we both can come up with some options where we know we're not going to get 80,000. We need actually, actually 20,000. We only have four. So how do I solve this problem? It's not easily resolvable. Then where essentially this whole idea of mutual value creation, negotiation and discussion has to come in, rooted in scientific facts. That's basically where I think you can think of really how do I get around this mess? Because it, otherwise it becomes such a complex problem that it, nothing can be done. So are, are you saying that when you face a, a complex problem, try to only work on part of it? No. Uh, what I would say that uh, the, prob, uh, the approach should be problem driven meaning that you have to define a particular problem that you want to solve. So here I have defined the problem that I want to resolve the dry season flow in the Ganges. That is my problem. Right, but isn't that really a part of the larger problem of <laughs> managing the Ganges? 
It is. It is. No question about it. No question about it. And I don't think there is any way to disentangle this. Can you take it all separately? No, you cannot. So then what do you do? So at one extreme, then you can think of really that everything is interconnected with everything else. If that is the case, then you are in a mess. That mess right. simply cannot be untangled. Right. Then you can argue that no, no, you are essentially being, being reductionist because you are trying to reduce the problem to something that is simpler. To some extent, yes, but what we want to be careful really when I'm defining the problem for the dry season, I don't want it to be a reductionist problem that basically it will not get affected by flood. So I need to be careful really, the, the lesser the dry season is eight months. These eight months will be affected by other four months too. How, that is the question. If they're cleanly separable, then it's easy, but they are not cleanly separable. They will not be. So this is where the complexity will come. I don't think how hard we try, you will be able to go in. That's the reason scientific method is important because you need to keep this idea of experimentation valid. So you observe, you ask questions, you hypothesize, you experiment, analyze, conclude, and keep doing this. Then you go here. So I think that this, I don't think we need to go this because this is more into... Recognize that basically there is no panacea here. So if there is no panacea, then what is there? What I am saying that we need to be precise in diagnosing the problem. So, so here the whole approach that we are trying to take is that it is a problem driven approach. It is not a theory driven approach. So I have a problem. The, that problem is to solve dry season water problem in Bangladesh or in India. Now to do this, then I, so that is my diagnosis of the problem. Now, what are the facets of the diagnosis? What are the aspects do I need to do? Is it really to keep a Calcutta port navigable? Or is it really to stop saltwater intuition in Sundarbon in Bangladesh? Or both are important. If both are important, then how do I try to see really, given the limited amount of water that I have, can I do both? If I cannot, then do I have other options? What if I use groundwater? Can I use groundwater in a year and next year, basically I have more rain, it gets filled. With groundwater also, I cannot use it forever because it will get depleted. So those are the type of discussion that has to happen. So the precisely the point with complex system is that complex systems will not allow you to give a solution that is static. It will give you a solution given that particular problem, given that time and space scale. Then what we need to be careful is that we monitor and we keep adapting to the changing situations. So that being said, they say we have to embrace complexity with humility then. That is not that basically I'm going to give you a solution that you have it. There is no prescription that is universal. I cannot do it. I'm just being very honest and blunt. But at the same time, I'm giving you a framework. That framework will allow you to do things in certain ways. Then you think in a systematic way. What does that mean? That means that you try to define what your system boundary is. What are the nodes and links in that system? So that you, when you get this spaghetti diagram, what are the nodes and links that create this spaghetti diagram and that is understandable and systematically manageable? Then you say, okay, I diagnose and prescribe. So I'm saying that you need to prescribe. So what do you, how do you prescribe then? The way you prescribe by understanding the capacity of the system as well as the constraints that system imposes on you. What that means really, the capacity and constant for the Ganges between Bangladesh and India will be quite different if you are trying to do it for the Nile between Egypt and Ethiopia. So the challenge here is that you have diagnosed the problem. Now you have to give, you have to give some prescription. That prescription must be consistent with the capacity that your system has. And that capacity can involve basically from human capital to basically actual assets of money to cultural values and everything else. But not all of them are important at a given time. The challenge for us as a water diplomat is to find out what those are and try to define that subset. Otherwise, this set is very large. You can go to the Ganges and assume that, look, Ganges water is probably one of the most polluted water in the world, but it is the 
most holy water for Hindus in India. So I cannot basically start questioning their cultural value. That has to be taken into account. So that is the capacity and constant the system is imposing on me. Then I say that there is no, no panacea. So let's be clear about this, that there is no simple generalizable best practices. Then I said, okay. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me, Shafi. When you say diagnose and prescribe using capacity and constraints, you don't mean that you can't enhance the capacity you can, you can. with resources from outside the system, right? No, I don't. I think very good point. No question. So I think we have to be exactly, I think we, we, we need to bring in other, capacity is not fixed. Capacity can be enhanced, capacity can be reinforced, even I think can be built and even can be taken as an outside energy. So World Bank can create more, basically can put in money. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I need to be a little bit more careful there. It's not that, so no, let's not assume that the system capacity and constraints are fixed. Okay. So the question is, basically, do we need anything else? Because I'm also teaching this similar class at top, so I think so we did pose this question. So, and I'm asking maybe you guys also that, okay, so if, is this a more or less general abstract level of things that we need to do to start addressing the problem? Then we'll get into very quickly our arsenic problem, the how this can be applied in real time. So maybe I think, I, I don't know, how much time do we have on, on image? I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. all right, so let's do the, I think maybe I'll just go into this. But, but could you could you just go back one for a minute to the diagram, to the list you had? You said, is you know, the question marks at the end, is that, is that yeah. sufficient? Is that complete? Yeah. Do we need anything else? Like one question you raised, I think I need to, this my, my uneasiness yeah. with that list is that if you're going to act adaptively, if you're going to continue to review and change what you're doing, you need to have the institutional capacity to do that, sure. you have to build the, the institutional capacity to think and act systematically, to build the capacity to adapt, adapt uh, uh, act adaptively. And so the person who's talking about taking action, I think, needs to think about the institutional design for the process that makes this list possible. And that itself becomes an item on the list. Sure. Good point. Any other thoughts? All right, I think so. let's see whether we can. So essentially that what we are arguing, so I hope I convinced you that there is no established methodology exists to resolve complex problems because these problems are not deterministic, not random. So that means you cannot use classical physics or you cannot use statistical mechanics to do this. Then, at the same time, these problems can neither be fully explored by the positivist, meaning this hypothesis testing type of framework that I was arguing that with five senses. So you cannot just use scientific methods, nor can you use just interpretations. So it's not that basically you can use either or methods, really. So you cannot use purely scientific method. You cannot use purely subjective ethnographic methods to address these problems what then you have to do really is some way to basically combine your scientific facts and social facts. So that's what it's all about. And if you look at the paper that I sent you to read, the arsenic contamination problem essentially tries to do this, is to explain the problem from a scientific facts perspective, then use the understanding, meaning the social facts, to actually address the problem. So what that means still is, so let's go, I think this thing you've seen before, I will not go here, so I go here. So I use an illustrative case. The illustrative case is that it can support a theory. So the arsenic contamination problem is used here as an illustrative case, meaning that it illustrates that it's a complex problem, but it does not really provide any validation of the theory. 
but we have also used it as an extended case, meaning that if I take this case and I look at all the features, what I see really here is this is a coupled natural and human system problem. In this coupled natural and human system problem, when I intervene, it gives rise to emergent properties. And then it, it becomes a complex problem. So that means I can use this to show really when you have this type of coupling, you will expect these type of things to happen. So now if you take actually what happened then, there is, so you have basically Bangladesh has decided that they will promote groundwater use as a case study that we are using it here. There were two policy goals. They want to increase agricultural productivity and reduce infant mortality. So these were the policy goals they wanted to do. A very sharp, a very well defined, easily measurable. And then you go and then you see this. So this is where essentially now if you try to link all these different components, different variables, processes, now you see this is a mess. And this mess really is not new. And it, this is not even our mess. I think many people have created this type of mess. They call this system diagram and interaction diagram, whatever. And we are saying that this is really so old. Basically, it doesn't allow me to do anything. I just totally get paralyzed. So it's not going to work because things are interconnected. We understand that part. The question then is becomes, how do you diagnose or sharply define the problem that not all of these links and nodes are equally important? Only some are. The question is, which are? So in the case of like dry season flu, we gave you an example really. If that is what we want to do. So that's a much simpler definition of the problem with the interconnections and interdependencies. Those will be needed. Once you have that, then you can go here. So if you look at what Bangladesh has done, they wanted to have two policy goals, and these were achieved really with tremendous success. It has increased agricultural productivity, decreased infant mortality. Agricultural productivity has gone up by almost 100%. Infant mortality was the lowest in South Asia. So in, in those terms, it was very good really, very basically successful story from 1960 to almost 1980s. Then what you started seeing that arsenic contamination emerges now. In 1960, they did not expect that arsenic contamination will come. The difficulty they have created, they have not measured, so they were not following it. So they were not really monitoring the progress. They are not being adaptive. They did not care. So as a result, it emerges. Even that emergence did not really lead to any action. It took another 15 years. Before, on the, the, the day first the arsenic was detected in water, then to actually create something at the government level, it took 15 years. Why did it take that long? So that's what basically the system failed. Then you have taken interventions which led to even more unintended emergence. If you remember, really, you looked at this, basically they put red and green wells. Now the villages that had red wells now have problems with basically girls getting married because they have a stigma. So the, you've created a social stigma by creating a solution that you wanted to do because you wanted to let people know that there is this well is red, meaning it has high arsenic concentration. So what, where did that come from? What I argue that basically this was also really, what we learned from this, this was a theory driven causality based reasoning. Where did that come from? So that really came from if you, know the story of cholera in London in 1854. In John Snow found out that he was an epidemiologist, he found out that there is a cholera outbreak in London and they cannot find out what is going on. So he did a very systematic way of finding out who has cholera, where they get drinking water is coming from, and he found out a well. And he went and basically shut that, that well down, cholera went away. So that is basically my theory or my basically scientific knowledge that I used in Bangladesh also without understanding anything else. So I basically went and start painting everything red because the snow did it and it stopped cholera. So if I do this, arsenic will be stopped. Yes, it will be. The only difficulty there is that this is rural Bangladesh, number one. I have over 10 million wells right now and not one. So as a result, really, my theory doesn't go with actually what is happening on the ground. So we got into serious mess and that took another 20 years to unfold. So what would happen really in a principle pragmatic approach really what you want to do really, you want to find out a problem driven question. 
So the question was that really, okay, so I have infant mortality problem in Bangladesh. So to solve that infant mortality problem, I found out the quickest solution. What was the quickest solution? They uh, dig some shallow wells. It's cheaper, it's quicker, fine. And we have done that. And that is perfectly fine. What was missing there is that they did not monitor really the progression of this. They just assumed that it's a simple solution, it will stay forever. If they have monitored this, they would have found out long ago. That's why basically this problem-driven question with hypothesis consistent with observed signals. I need to keep observing the system as it evolves. If I can do this, then I have an approach that is more or less functional. So to summarize then basically what we need to do really, we need to first find out a very sharp definition of the problem that we want to address. Then find out whether is this a simple problem, complicated problem or a complex problem. Then find out if it is a complex problem, that what is the complexity coming from? Is the complexity coming from the scientific unknown or is it coming from the social fact? Those are alternatives. Then try to synthesize these two then design an intervention with some basically targeted metric that this is what I want to do and then monitor this as you go along. Then you could be adaptive and find out a solution that will basically be resilient and change also over time. There is no universal solution. So if you one message you want to take, I think that would be that there is no universal generalizable solution for complex systems. Complex systems will bring even more problems once you try to solve them. By the time you have solved them, you have given rise to another set of problems. And this is also nothing new, really. This has been done in with ladies' department for many years, from like Sean to other people. They have talked about these problems almost 50 years ago. That the idea of really, when you're trying to do these social problems, really, by the time you solve the problem, you have given rise to another set of problems. So the challenge is to essentially be very aware of that problem nature will change. And if it does really, how do I detect them early on so that I can be adaptive and act accordingly? We'll stop here. So do, do you have any final question to Shafiq? What are your thoughts about the enabling conditions between India and Pakistan on the uh, on on uh, taking up the revisions in the Indus Water Treaty? No, enabling conditions should be those will remain three. What you want to do really, hopefully, I think, is that what are the main issues of contentions right now? That needs to be discussed because I have not following recently about the industry. So, what? would be good, I think, for if you can identify one or two things that both countries are in disagreement with. What is that really? So I can give you one example, for example, for Brahmaputra is that what I followed recently is, say, for example, India is claiming that China is holding all the water and then it will create problem. Physically, that is not true. Because the amount of water that is coming from Brahmaputra for China, even if China, we did this study with domination with another Chinese student we had, even if they decide to keep all the water in China, it will have no impact in India. Although they are making that claim. So this is a, essentially a social myth they want to create, that yeah, the China is creating problem. But these are not based on facts. So what you want to do really with Indus to find out really, is it possible to find some very sharp scientific facts, those are observable. Like one example I use with Bangladesh and India for the Ganges, even if I give all the water to India in the dry season, India will still not be able to basically make their Calcutta port navigable during the dry season. So that means this is a non-starter. Why we start fighting with this? Try to find something else then. Although, of course, it will create serious problem if India keeps all the water in the dry season. But even if Bangladesh decides, I'll give you everything, still it will not solve the problem. So that means you need alternative sources now. That part has not been explored. Before we finish, I, I just want to thank Shafiq again. 
Um, we and I have worked together a long time on this, and I'm always learning something new each time I hear him present this material. Uh, so thank you for taking the time, Chepi, to meet with the class and for sharing your ideas. Um, and thank you for having such good ideas. Yeah. So no, thank you very much. No, this I think no, I don't want to embarrass Larry. Larry has been an inspirational mentor. So because many of the things that I discussed today, I did not know Eric about maybe 15 years ago when I started talk. So we have been talking for a long time now. So yeah, mm -hmm. if you look at this guy, he would say that you need 10,000 hours really to develop any set of expertise. So between both of us, we probably spend more than 10,000 hours now. Mm -hmm. so hopefully we have some level of at least understanding mm -hmm. if not expertise. Yeah, yeah but, also, also, yeah, from our side, yeah. For everybody in the class, right? The other people in this class are potentially the person you'll find yourself coming back to and working with. Uh, when Shafiq and I, we did not know each other when we first yeah. um, encountered some overlap in our interests and we just kept creating opportunities to exchange our thoughts and a sort of animesh then gets added to the mix and now extends both of our ideas and our work and his own work. Uh, so everybody in the class should imagine that you, it's, it's through these interactions with your colleagues that you shape and sharpen your ideas. So um, I think, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So for the class, I think I have a challenge for you. So since you did not share much of your thoughts, maybe you're too shy. So think about the uh, arsenic paper that you read. I want you to find out at least one hole or one thing that you found that this is really outrageously stupid. It's not going to work. So I gave, gave that same challenge to my students also. So there are a few things that I have issues. I did not share those with you, but I will not tell you right now, I think. But I want you to see really what, like, let me raise something very, interesting here that if the institutional mechanism is not there, if the capacity is constant, it's not going to work. So we need to refine that. But are there anything else you see really in terms of making it operational? What we are saying that, see, at one point, I said the complex systems, you don't have generalizable solutions, you don't have any prescription, but then we are giving you prescription too. So the line is very subtle here. But at the same time, I don't see a way around it. So the question is basically, how do I bring in these ideas of principles of scientific methods, which are more replicable, more uh, reproducible with the social facts, which are going to be continuously subjective, continuously contentious. But at the same time, this has to be made. So that's where basically, where are the hiccups or where are the binding constant that will essentially let it fail? If you can think of one or two ideas, that will be good. Or maybe an example that you have seen in your real life, where you tried to apply this and see it did not work. He wants you to be a white hat hacker of his work. Yep, that'll be good. Find find programming problems. Exactly. So find find a hole, and then yeah, yeah. that will be very nice. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the way ideas get sharpened. Because otherwise, yeah. because yeah. you get stagnant. Yeah, and also apart from that, uh, even if you have uh, your own uh, specific issue regarding auto diplomacy that can be uh, related to the theory that Shopik mentioned, you can also write him an email so that, yeah. Sure, okay. please, yeah. please feel yeah. free. That's All right, I'm going to disappear, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Larry. Take I look, look forward to the presentation starting next week. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.